Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and we are back looking at another hypothetical US high speed rail city pair. Get ready for high plains, high speed rail. In the west, we have Denver, Colorado, with a population of 3 million. It is the largest metro in Colorado and 19th largest in the US. Denver has bus, light rail, and commuter rail services through RTD. Importantly, heavy commuter rail here is electric. Denver International Airport is a sprawling hub 19 miles from the city center. It is the third busiest airport in the United States. Intercity rail is provided by Amtrak on the California Zephyr between San Francisco and Chicago. Colorado is also studying a 173-mile passenger rail service along its front range from Pueblo to Fort Collins, an area which represents the vast majority of the Colorado population. To the east is Kansas City, Missouri. The Kansas City Metro has a population of 2.2 million in large portions of Missouri and Kansas, making it the 31st largest in the country. Kansas City Metro Transit is provided by the Kansas City Area Transit Authority, which is a bi-state agency and operates in both Missouri and Kansas. The authority provides bus and bus rapid transit services. Kansas City proper has a short streetcar line that is currently being expanded. Keikata is also planning a light rail line. Kansas City International is a mid-major airport the 42nd largest in the country, handling about six times less traffic than Denver International. It is located 15 miles from the city center in Missouri. Intercity passenger rail is provided by Amtrak on the Southwest Chief and Missouri River Runner. Of note, direct Amtrak service between Denver and Kansas City does not currently exist. Denver and Kansas City are 560 miles apart as the crow flies, at about 5.7 million people, this is the smallest city pair corridor we've looked at so far by a factor of two. Between, we find mostly small towns and cities. The notable exceptions are Topeka, Kansas, the state capital with a metro population of 230,000, and Lawrence, Kansas, home of the University of Kansas Jayhawks, which has a metro population of 120,000 and a student population of 28,000. Those are 60 and 35 miles from downtown Kansas City respectively as the crow flies. Transit for both takes the form of bus service. Before getting to the route, let's quickly discuss the guiding principles that shaped it. There are three basic categories and some subcategories within them. These are in no particular order, there is some contradiction among these ideas, and whichever best suits the situation will be applied. In terms of technology, we're looking at non-tilting Alstom Avelia Liberties or a Siemens American Pioneer 220. These are electric trains that receive their power from overhead catenary wires. Both are approved for manufacture and use in the United States, and both are capable of 220 miles per hour in service. For the purposes of this video, I will be capping speed at 200 miles per hour, which is more typical in service around the world. Now on to the route. Moving from west to east, we will start in Denver at its oft-admired Union Station, which already features catenary over heavy rail. Union Station's longest platforms are long enough to support high-speed rail. Theoretically, high-speed rail could run here unaltered. Access to bus service and light rail is made available via a two-block long subterranean walkway slash bus depot. Commuter rail is accessed at the main Union Station platforms, including the A-Line, which connects to Denver International. Denver Union is sort of on the edge of the downtown area, but most of the rest of downtown is within walking distance. The first three miles out of Union Station are slow with at-grade crossings, this cannot be reasonably improved. A few commuter rail stations would need to be rebuilt, like the 38th Street station here. 
After that, geometry opens up to 110 mile per hour travel. Still some at grade crossings, but that is fine for this speed. At Airport Boulevard, the A line to the airport branches off to the north and it's off to the races for our high speed rail line. Speed will be 200 miles per hour and stay there for a while. Tracks will be grade separated from here on out. The first major obstacle is the transition from Union Pacific right of way to Interstate 70 on the east side of Aurora, Colorado. Interstate 70 is paralleled by freight rail most of the way, affording a choice between options. However, Interstate 70 is faster most of the time. 12 miles east, the track would break out of the interstate alignment to smooth several curves. This will be a running theme. For rural parts of the route, I have it within freeway right-of-way about 40% of the time, with a total of 47 miles of elevated sections to get up and over obstacles. This part through the town of Straussburg, Colorado would account for 5 miles of that. This continues through somewhat rugged terrain and several small towns until reaching Lyman, Colorado. To retain speed in the face of the terrain, tracks deviate from the interstate and into an abandoned rail right-of-way. Then through town on three miles of viaduct to get between the interstate and freight right-of-way owned by Genesee and Wyoming. Then back to the status quo for 120 miles across the border into Kansas until about 20 miles past Goodland, Kansas. Here neither the interstate nor freight rail geometries are favorable. My solution is 40 miles of new right-of-way featuring a large 7 mile radius S-curve. Another 80 miles of the in or near the freeway right-of-way paradigm gets the route to Hayes, Kansas, which is the first city of significance east of the Denver area at about 20,000 people. Our express train won't stop here, but several crossings of freight would enable the state of Kansas to extend local fast passenger rail to downtown areas this far out, 250 miles from Kansas City. I have something like that utilizing 125 mile per hour capable diesel electrics and a combination of Union Pacific right-of-way and this new high-speed trunk we're talking about to cover the 213 miles between Hayes and Topeka, Kansas in about three hours with eight or nine stops at minimal additional capital expense. That would serve another 150,000 people in addition to the Topeka, Lawrence, and Kansas City areas. Back to our high-speed rail line and it's near the interstate paradigm for another 90 miles east of Hayes. The freeway and freight rail geometry between Salina and Junction City are rotten and Abilene in the middle is difficult to plow through so we'll go around in a 40 mile arc of new right-of-way. At Junction City, the route would slow to 150 miles per hour to navigate a series of curves through the interface of the Kansas River Valley and a series of rugged hills. This would last for about 10 miles before continuing on at full speed, 200 miles per hour. 10 miles west of that hour, route would hop out of the interstate right-of-way, then join Union Pacific tracks briefly as part of a broad arc still at 200 miles per hour. Then crossing Union Pacific tracks at the Kansas River and running between Union Pacific right-of-way and the river at 90 miles per hour until reaching Topeka. In Topeka, things would slow significantly while running next to Interstate 70 and then down the middle of 1st Street on Viaduct, entering a slow speed curve and then finally pulling in to the new Topeka station at ground level. The ground runs uphill here, so the grade back to ground level is a little easier given the short distance. Here we are in beautiful downtown Topeka, let's check travel times. For these 535 miles from Denver, Colorado to Topeka, Kansas, I have a time of 2 hours 53 minutes. That is a scorching average of 185 miles per hour with over 90% of the distance covered at full speed. That's the magic of the plains. Wop, 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 wop. The heart of downtown is a half mile from this station site on the other side of Interstate 70. 
The state capital is three quarters of a mile. Unfortunately, the county jail is closer than both. South out of the Topeka station, once under 6th Street, the route would need to rise up about 45 feet to get over Interstate 70 in about 3,500 linear feet. That works out to a 2% max grade, which isn't ideal near a station, but it's slow through here anyway. Also, Interstate 70 from the west isn't any faster and there is no good way to bypass Topeka, which is why I picked this solution. The next stop is Lawrence, Kansas, 24 miles away. This lessens the benefit of getting to top speed, so we'll cruise at 110 miles per hour, which is afforded by the interstate geometry, and it saves a few bucks in the process. Unfortunately, Lawrence's lovely downtown is not readily accessible by high-speed rail. The right-of-way is constrained there by the riverfront plaza development. There is room for maybe one additional track, and that's a BNSF freight line, so forget about it. I am opting to put the station alongside Interstate 70 and the Kansas River. This is two miles from downtown and three miles from the University of Kansas with some nearby space for development, but also a lot in the floodplain. Let's check travel times. Topeka to Lawrence is 24 miles. I have that at 16 minutes for an average of 90 miles per hour. That renders the 559 miles from Denver to Lawrence at 3 hours 11 minutes for an average of 176 miles per hour, including the stop. Now let's head to our final destination, Kansas City, Missouri. All aboard! East of the river, the freeway geometry opens up a little and 175 mile per hour is possible for 24 miles with a few adjustments. This route passes right by the Kansas Speedway Mega Entertainment and Shopping Complex. This includes an outdoor world and a truly mammoth building called Nebraska Furniture Mart. Is it a mall? Is, is it a store? I don't understand. Man was I tempted to put a station here, but it's only 13 miles from downtown Kansas City. There should definitely be a regional stop here though. East of this suburban wonderland, the route will need to cross the Kansas River again and from there it will move into Missouri, hugging the Kansas River briefly outside of the levee on Viaduct before transitioning to BNSF right of way at about 90 miles per hour but slowing rapidly. It's a bit of a tangle coming into Kansas City but it looks possible using space near the old Kansas City Terminal Railway Roundhouse than just enough room to squeeze under Interstate 35. Like Topeka, there are some grades to deal with, but it would be slow going here anyway. We'll stop at Kansas City Union Station. This site has been altered over the years and now has a science museum where its western train shed was previously, which is a shame for our train, but there is enough room to fit new platforms into the overall space. This handsome train station features a direct connection to Kansas City Streetcar and downtown. It's also close by Crown Center, which is an interesting 1970s city of the future slash mall slash Hallmark Cards corporate headquarters. But we've made it to Kansas City. Let's check travel times. For this 597 mile trip across the plains, from Denver, Colorado to Kansas City, Missouri, through Topeka and Lawrence, Kansas, I have a travel time of three and a half hours for an average 170 miles per hour, including stops. This would be an extremely fast high speed rail line, but is it enough over this distance? Let's compare it to current air travel. I count 26 daily flights between Denver and Kansas City, totaling about 3,600 seats. Since Denver is a hub, some of those are likely connecting flights to other origins or destinations. That's not a lot of demand. Let's see how high-speed rail compares time-wise. Flying is about two and a half hours when considering extra airport time. Our high-speed express between Denver and Kansas City is three and a half hours. 
That's a clear loser metro to metro, but some market share capture is probable because trains are more comfortable and they make it easier to be more productive while riding. Considering both airports are far from their city's cores, high-speed rail does win city to city by about a half hour thanks to transit connections at stations on either end. This could cause a significant portion of point-to-point -point business travel to switch. We've established potential demand or lack thereof. Just a quick rundown of my cost estimation algorithm before getting to the cost and some sample results showing it provides reasonable ballpark figures. On number four, the relatively low cost of real estate in Kansas will help facilitate those 40 mile stretches of new right of way. With that out of the way, let's get to my estimated cost for high plains, high speed rail between Denver, Colorado and Kansas City, Missouri. At an average of 170 miles per hour, it would be one of the fastest in the world. I have that at $42.3 billion. That is a reasonable $71 million per mile. However, that is two thirds the projected cost of the LA to Phoenix route I just did and would serve one fourth the population. Is it worth it? Or is this idea a tumbling tumbleweed? Let me know what you think in the comments. Plenty more of your favorite channel series on the way. I'm going to start working on a video for the Federal South Central High Speed Rail Corridor, which runs from San Antonio, Texas through Dallas, Fort Worth to Oklahoma and Arkansas. So keep an eye out for that. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.